Guys, I'm really excited about what God's doing in our lives and in your groups. Uh, you have before you your, your booklets, your, your binders, and we're at the uh, retreat, the April retreat. And our goal uh, for today is to take a, another step towards fulfilling what we believe it is that God has put on our hearts. Uh, our, our goal is to equip you so that you can better equip those that come into your life, into your ministry areas. And the time that you take uh, out of your days, the time that you take to prepare is, hey, is so vital. Dennis. Because it's a part of a greater, a greater commission. Uh, when we gather together and work together. And so much of what we do, sometimes we feel like kind of an island by ourselves. And when we're in that island by ourselves, we may or may not work together. We, we may or may not even do our stuff. I know if, uh, if I lived in a neighborhood completely by myself, I'm sure my grass would get a little higher, if possible. Uh, my bushes would get a little less trimmed, if possible. Because it... I wouldn't have any influence around me. And so part of when we gather together, we're, we're building up one another, iron sharpening iron, in order to better equip ourselves for what God's called us to. So what has God called us to? Why, why do we do this? Is it just to have people in our homes? Is that the totality of it? Is it just to, to impart some wisdom to people? Is that the totality of it? I'd say no, not at all. Those are great elements of it, but the greater goal is that we believe that Life in Christ is the life that we were created for. And until we learn to live that life and display that life, we're not only cheating ourselves out of what God has given us, but we're the greatest message that could ever be shared is being thwarted. And so I want to encourage you as we spend this time together, ask questions. Because if you have a question, you're not the only one that has the question. Interact with it. And then help us at the end come together with a better system to prepare for a better harvest. Because I believe the, the field is still white to harvest. And you are in the forefront of the laborers. Bless you. that are going forth. So let me pray a prayer of welcome. And uh, get us started uh, today. And then I'll invite Dennis up. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for this morning. We thank you for a beautiful morning you've given us. Thank you for a great breakfast with great friends. And ask that as we spend this time together. It be time well spent. We thank you for comfortable chairs to sit at, a, a room with air conditioning. There are a lot of people that meet around this world. And they're out in the hot sun. They're, they're sitting on stumps or even squatting or sitting in the install on the ground. And so uh, we realize we're sacrificing some time, but our sacrifice seems so small compared to what some of our brothers and sisters are doing. So, Lord, we want to we wanna give you our full attention this morning. We want to give you our full attention investment of our character, of our time, and of our efforts. Lord, paint before us this morning a vision, a vision for what we could be. Help us to see what the things that we need to do to accomplish that and how we need to order our lives to make that happen. Father, I thank you that you've given us great people to partner together. You've given us uh, gifted people that can help lead and direct. And I thank you, Father, that you've knit our hearts together for a time such as this, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 First, we're going to do an exercise, and uh, we got some handouts to give you. And if you don't have a pen, they'll give you a pen. Uh, so everybody ought to get one page. It'll say uh, characteristics. Of, it'll have two columns on it of lines like this. <coughs> Now, as far as your uh, leader notebook, uh, my intention was to give you a packet of papers to put behind tab 7 where you take notes today. Instead, you have tab 7, which is for this meeting, and there's nothing behind it. So you got two options today. Uh, one, you can take some of your notes, uh, blank pages from tab 5 and move some blank pages, or you can just take your notes uh, for this meeting, appropriately label them at the top. Um, under the monthly meeting. So there's plenty of blank paper in there, but it's not in the right place. For those of you like me, you will definitely want to put it under tab seven because that's where it's supposed to go. Uh, for the rest of you, just take your notes on a piece of blank paper. And, uh, 
as you're doing that, if you do that and listen, I'll, I'll tell you why the notebook. Uh, I recently was very blessed to uh, have Ronnie and Glory Lee share with me their notes that went back to the small group formation in 1983, if I remember right, is that... Um, and all the transcripts of the teaching and the leader's notebooks and, and all that wealth of information, most of which went through my hands at one point in time, and I don't have any more, uh, to my chagrin. See, so, uh, but what they do? They, they kept it, they kept it together. That's challenging for somebody like me. I'm, I'm not the best paper organizer. So we're giving you a notebook. It's just a place to keep stuff. And then when you want, say, I need something for the leader stuff, it's in, in a notebook that you can find. Okay, everybody's got the sheet. It says characteristics of Christ on one column, unchrist-like un characteristics on the other column. What we want to do is put a little meat on the bones when we talk about this whole issue of transformation. So what we're going to do, I'm going to walk through on steps. I don't want you to be worrying about the second steps and third steps. Uh, first thing I want you to do is individually just write... Uh, three or four or five single words or phrases under characteristics of Christ. Now, I'm not looking for he was Middle Eastern, he was the son of Joseph. His characteristics, if you knew him, hopefully you do, how you would describe him. Um, and what's he like? You might, I'll, I'll help you a little. Uh, I think he was an extremely joyful person because he promised that his joy could be in us, so he had joy. So I put joyful. That's all I'm going to give you. So just write down three or four. Uh, you're not going to turn any of this in. Characteristics of Christ. Okay, for you type A personalities, you're going, wait, wait, I want to write more. That's all right. Uh, hold what you got. Uh, now, what we're going to do is a little bit of a table exercise. And uh, I need two things from you. First, somebody at your table is going to have to serve as a secretary and spokesperson, the same person. And what they're going to do is just help y'all compile a list at your table that represents y'all's table's efforts. And then you'll participate in helping me as I call on you just to call out one or two from your list. So you got two requirements. You've got to be able to write and talk. Okay? We're not going to spend 45 minutes picking. Uh, so somebody uh, at each table say, it's me. Okay, got one, got one, got one. It's not pointing at each other. It's saying, it's me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Has every table got one? Okay, because you fix them, start working. Now, what I want you to do is just as a table, uh, take turns and, and kind of call out the ones you've got at your table, and the secretary will compile them. So you'll have a list of the characteristics of Christ as represented by your table. So uh, just do that. You can do it in any way you want. The person in the secretary can go around, let somebody add which ones they have, and just compile a list. <laughs> Which table are you at, Jerry? With uh, Jimmy and Kay. And Don. Yeah, go to 
Okay, y'all are still working, but that's okay. We're going to shift gears. So, well, we hadn't gathered our whole group. That's right. We're going to do some more gathering now. And uh, what I'm going to do is just go table by table and ask you to just give me three from your spokesperson. And the next table, you want to try to give three that hadn't been said yet. Okay, so we're just kind of building the list. As we get all the way to the end, you may say they got all ours. That's fine. I mean, it'd be nice we all know the same Jesus, so we'd probably have some overlap. So let's start this table over here. I can't go there. Uh, who's the spokesperson? Chad, your table. Matt, give us three. Loving. Loud. Loving. Loving. Intentional. Intentional. And patient. Patient. Okay. Uh, Don. Prefer others. Serve others. Giving. Okay. Prefer others. Serving. Giving. Maybe if I can help, we'll put some uh, nouns or something in where we can. Servant, maybe. And a giver. I'm trying to get key on him. His characteristics as a person as opposed to his actions. Um, okay. Lee's table. Uh, joyful. Joyful. What's the middle one? Goodness. Goodness. Mercy, mercy. Okay, here in the front center, but y'all got to add. Oh, uh, caring. Caring. Understanding. Peaceful. Peaceful. Oh, knocked on mine out almost. Okay, uh, center back there. Uh, compassionate. Passionate. Compassionate. Compassionate. Oh, Passion and compassionate? No, compassionate. Okay, compassionate. Humble. Humble. And just. And just. We'll cheat. We'll make him passionate too. That's probably fair. Okay, uh, up here. Truthful. Truthful, okay. Faithful. Faithful. Obedient. Obedient. Okay. <laughs> wise, wise, gentle, gentle, and passionate. Last word? Passionate. Passionate. Good. I knew we'd get that one. There we go. Okay. Long-suffering, pleasing, and obedient. Okay. Long-suffering. What's the second one? Pleasing. Pleasing and obedient. Pleasing. And obedient, okay. And uh, Olive's back here. I'm speaking. <coughs> uh, is grateful. grateful and knowledgeable. Okay. I heard kind floating up. Sensitive. From, sensitive. Okay. Uh, let's see. Two I have I haven't heard. Uh, unhurried. And approachable. Okay, let's you now we'll just kind of open it up. If you have one on your list that you hadn't heard that you think is a characteristic of Jesus, just uh, shout them out and I'll keep up with you. Forgiving. Forgiving. Teacher. Teacher. Wise. wise. Okay, wise. Meek. I am. I am. What about tolerant? Tolerant. Creative. Wow. <laughs> Confronting. I heard that over there. He's one to confront things. Didn't yeah, stick his head in the sand. Sacrificial. Sacrificial. And what's back here? Steadfast. Steadfast. Sensitive. Sensitive. That's about third woman that said sensitive. <laughs> Spiritual. Okay. That was fun. Let's go to the next stage. Not as much fun. Now what we want to do is individually again go through and make some list of unchrist-like characteristics, kind of the other side of the coin. Okay, some of them will kind of match up with the Christ-like characteristics. If he's unhurried, then unchrist-like might be frenzied. So some of those will pair up, some won't. Don't worry about being 
specific about it, but just list a few unchristlike characteristics. Kind of things that you might, like I do at the end of the day, say, well, I wasn't very Christ-like today when I... Well, I can end it there. Okay, y'all are getting the hang of it, and not surprisingly, um, the next step is as a table, we're going to compile our list. Now, we don't need to editorialize on who in particular we saw that characteristic in, like my spouse is unchristlike when he, I mean, we don't need that part, just the, the comment. Um, uh, so, again, with the same secretary, uh, by tables, just compile your things, plus your list out there. Let's start compiling. Um, this list could potentially take the rest of the day, so we won't have to exhaust it. Uh, but we will kind of start in the opposite direction this time. Start back there. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. Let me get, get focus a second. All right, y'all ready? You know, you're filling out your list. Go ahead, Jim. Proud, dishonest, selfish. Proud, dishonest, selfish. Sure, all that's uh, in a very abstract sense. Nobody you have in mind. Um, up here, who was it? Ada. Ada? Okay, we have wicked. Wicked. Sick and unconcerned. What's the second word? Sick. 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 Wicked, sick, and unconcerned. Um, let's see, Mary Beth? Uh, greedy. Greedy. Mm -hmm. uh, isolated. Isolated. Jealous. Um, who did it here? Uh, narcissistic. Oh, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to explain that for some of us. <laughs> Egotistical. In love with yourself. Egotistical. Okay, narcissistic. Yeah. Yeah. Unforgiving. Unforgiving. And disobedient. And disobedient. Okay, back to the back. Uh, who's speaking back there? Right here? Yep. Uh, dull, fearful, and timid. Dull, fearful, dull. and... Timid. Most... Timid. Timid. Yes. <laughs> dull, fearful, and timid. We certainly wouldn't think yeah. Jesus was any of those. Okay, up here to the front. What do y'all got? Okay. Uh, uh, unforgiving, dishonest, proud. Okay, now if you got someone that you're hearing that aren't on your list, jot some notes because you're going to need them. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to say those again. Tell me again. Un oh, uh, what is it? Hateful. Hateful. Un unforgiving. Unforgiving. Proud. Proud. Okay. Uh, let's see. Don. Being spirited, materialistic, arrogant. Arrogant, mean-spirited, materialistic, arrogant. Okay, up to the lees. Demanding, lying, vengeful. 
can see why I suggested we not identify these with any particular people or situation. Uh, Mr. Chandler. Uh, argumentative, threatening, and degrading. Interesting. Argumentative. Threatening. And degrading. Yeah. Um, let's see. What have I got that I hadn't heard? Uh, anxious. Frenzied and aloof. Okay, anybody else? One that you hadn't heard, Laville? Jealous, okay. Unfaithful. And if you're hearing something you hadn't got, put it on your list. Unfaithful. Unfaithful. Gossip. Bitter. Gossip. Bitter gossip. A bitter gossip. All right, <laughs> <laughs> most gossip is good. <laughs> Lazy. Unloving. Lazy. 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 Deceitful. Oh. Deceitful. Okay, wait, y'all are going faster than I am, right? Uh, Close minded. Accuser. Hurry. Stingy. Haughty. Lustful. Mm. Lustful. Controlling. Thank you. Oh, yeah. If Jesus was sensitive, the rest of the husbands are insensitive. <laughs> Pushy. Pushy. Okay. That's, that's depressed me. Let's do something else. We said that the good ones. All right. Now, let me assure you the next steps are extremely private. Okay, nobody's going to ask you for your answers. You won't turn in your answers. Your next steps are yours. I just want you to uh, just be able to allow the Holy Spirit just to help you do some examination, kind of think about some of these things. First thing I want you to do is on your characteristics of Christ, I want you to read through the list. And for something on that list that you would just as soon not have in your life, I just want you to put an X by just read through the list of the characteristics of Christ. No, we're yeah, we're on the characteristics of Christ. So, like, if your first word's joyful, and you say, "Well, I don't want to be joyful," then put an X by joyful. Okay. Uh, so just go down this, and honestly, that is a little harder than it sounds. Perhaps, if we're honest, uh, maybe we don't want to be forgiving because if we forgive people, they'll keep doing the same thing to us over and over. Well. Uh, but we're, we're kind of just looking, what, what would we like to see in our life? So just read through the list for a minute. If there's one or two or eight or ten or 30 or 40, just put an X. Say, no, I don't want that. I'd just soon live without that. Getting by fine. Thank you. Some of you will spend some more time there. Some of you are ready to move on. So I'm going to give you the next step, but take time to stay wherever you need to be. Uh, the next step is under the unchristlike characteristics. What I want you to do is just go down that list and put a little circle by the ones that you really want to keep. I really want to, again, I, I want you to be honest where you're at. I mean, I, I had an extreme jealousy problem in my early years, and, and I it was a big control mechanism, and I used it to control people and dominate them. And uh, if you'd ask me if I wanted to get rid of it, if you said, Dennis, here's a pill. If you take it, you won't be jealous anymore. I don't know that I would have taken it. That unchristlikeness was serving me pretty well. So that's what I'm saying. You've got to kind of be honest with yourself. I finally took the pill. <laughs> it was getting to know Jesus better. And, uh, that's history now. Thank God. So I still have a wife. So just a little X beside any characteristics of Christ. A little circle beside any un-Christ-like characteristics that you would like to really hang on to.
Now, as we go through that, the truth is some of us that are brutally honest with ourselves may um, have one or two things in there that we're not sure we're ready to sign on for yet. Um, but by and large, you probably have a picture of a life the life of Christ that doesn't have very many X's by it. That's the life you'd like to have. And then you have a life of unchrist likeness, and you probably don't have very many zeros by those saying, I'd like to really hold on to this. I'm so excited to be an anxious, worried person. I can't wait to get up in the morning so I can find something to be anxious about. So I quickly flip on the news so I can find something to be anxious about. And I love to live in my anxiety. Um, so you probably are seeing two pictures. A picture of Christ. A picture of fallen people. And they don't sound anything alike. And one looks good. And one you probably don't care to hold on to. The next step is the hardest step in the exercise. Okay. And it's very private. If, if you think somebody can see your paper and you don't want to see your paper, put your arm around. This is private. This is your business. What I want you to do is I want you to go through the list of unchristlike characteristics. I want you to pick if you can. <coughs> if you have so arrived, you can't. That's okay. But if you can, pick two or three things on that list. Not that theoretically, abstractly is unchristlike, but two or three things on that list that you think applies to you and you would like to see changed. If you're that anxious person and you don't want to be anxious anymore, if that's a big one for you, just put a circle around that word. Right? Nobody will see it. Well, God will. <laughs> it's no surprise to him. So two or three, please don't beat yourself up in circle 30. Uh, just two or three. <laughs> now, if you're really having trouble seeing yourself in anything on the other list, you might ask somebody that knows you pretty well to help you with that part of the exercise. <laughs> they might be able to, like, prompt you to see something you won't see. Um, but not anybody that you are married to. Because it will not be pleasant. All right, now. I said that was the hardest part. It's not really the hardest part. This is the hardest part. Because now you got to do some make-believe. What I want you to do is to mentally turn back the clock four or five years and pretend we were doing this exercise four or five years ago. Now, this is going to take some work. You have to go back in time. You have to think. If you were doing this exercise four or five years ago, what are the two or three things you would have picked then that you wanted to see changed? I asked you the question today. What are two or three you'd like to just get rid of? And it's that anxiety. I just, man, I would just, I'd like to know what it is, just to rest in the boat. But what if I asked the same question four or five years ago?
So what, what do I conclude from my an answer to the last two questions? Well, it's possible the two or three things you would change today. Am I going up and down or is it just where I'm standing? quieter right here. It feels loud when I step to the side. Uh, now, if I look at the two or three things I would want to change today, and I look at the two or three things I would want to change say it was five years ago, they're going to either be the same or they're going to be different. So what does the significance of that mean? If there are the same. See, if you said, Dennis, five years ago, what would you like to have gotten rid of? Uh, I'd like to get rid of that anxiety. Dennis, today, what would you like to get rid of? Oh, I'd like to get rid of anxiety. What has changed in my life? Nothing. Same struggle five years later. Mine's not anxiety. Uh, probably mine today, what I'd like to see Holy gone is being controlling. Well, if you'd asked me five years ago, it would have been controlling. Ten years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, controlling. There are some others on the list that uh, five years ago I would have marked that are no longer an issue. See, so... If I've got two or three, and it's the same two or three I was struggling with five years ago, not much has changed. You know, maybe the struggle's gotten a little better. Maybe it's gotten a little worse. But, you know, basically, if, if you've been an uh, unforgiving person and, and you'd like to be more forgiving, and five years ago you were an unforgiving person, ten years ago you are an unforgiving person, then the progress from moving under that rock, the right list, the incorrect list, to the characteristics of Christ has not been significant. Now it may be that as you looked at the list, you'd have two or three things today, and this is what I think is the normal spiritual growth. You'd have two or three things today that the Holy Spirit's working on you to change, and uh, the things you would have marked five years ago are just history. Man, me and the Lord work together, He's transformed me, He's changed me, and that's gone. Now, I want to say this because it's real key to what we're talking about. As we talked about the characteristics of Christ and unchristlike characteristics, there's very little what did he do versus what do I do stuff. There's very little action stuff in there. It's mostly character stuff. What kind of person was he? And what kind of person am I? Or it's like hateful, unforgiving, mean-spirited, arrogant. Uh, we didn't get into much whether you dance or not, or you know, whether you eat more than you should at the table or something. I mean, so we aren't focusing on conduct as much as the kind of people we are. See? So the real challenge we face, and for some of you, your, your growth may be on a really good track to where the things three or four years ago are totally off the table. <coughs> One of the ones that, that I struggle with is, I said Jesus was approachable. The sinners liked him. People wanted to hang out with him. I don't know how it's going to change, but I, I don't think I'm very approachable. I, you know, our kids always went to Connie and asked her, and people would call our house with a question about small groups, and I answer the phone, and they say, is Connie there? And I'm like, well, what am I, chop liver? Well, we don't want to talk to you. Uh, I want to be approachable. See, that's something I want to see change. Now, I think if I had to rate that, I think that's made a tremendous change in the last uh, eight, ten years. It's just phenomenal, but it's still a ways to go. So... Just because you're still in the same category doesn't mean you're making progress. But the whole point of this is to help us start evaluating how change has taken place, how transformation has taken place. The last 
retreat we did. We talked about discipleship. We talked about transformation. We talked about learning to obey all that he commanded. We talked about becoming the kind of people that would do what Jesus would do if he were us. And so the focus today in this one half day that we're going to focus on is how does change take place? How, how do people go from the right list and be transformed toward the left list? Because if that is, in fact, the goal, then it becomes very important that we figure out how that happens. What brings it about? And so I'm going to share with you, and Pastor Daniel and I are going to just kind of weave in and out here today, and uh, at some appropriate time, we'll take a break, and uh, we'll have some drinks and snacks, and, uh, and get back to work pretty quickly. We started 15 minutes earlier, and we're ending two and a half hours earlier, so that doesn't mean we're going to cover any less ground, okay, we just got to listen faster. Uh, the, the teachings will be on video. And uh, so if you have somebody, a spouse or somebody that's not here, they can get the videos and watch it. I want to introduce to you, though, and for some of you, uh, you've heard it before from me. Some of you haven't. Uh, if you've heard it before, then you're listening as a Timothy. You're listening uh, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. Now teach them to faithful people so they can teach others. So if you've heard them before, then uh, the next question you ask yourself is, are you ready to teach them? Okay? And if you've heard it and you're ready to teach it, you enjoyed a good breakfast. If you've heard it and you're not ready to teach it, you're in the right place. Uh, if you're absolutely positive you're ready to teach it, uh, I'm tired. I'll sit down and let you get up and teach it. Uh, all right. I think we all need to be here. Pastor Daniel will teach it, but he's being gracious. All right. Vim. V-I-M. Uh, there are some very uh, brilliant people that I have a lot of respect for that say... That almost all, if not all, change that occurs in our life. I'm not being religious. I'm just talking about change. That change occurs in our life because of VIM. And what VIM stands for, the V stands for a vision. A vision of a new whiteboard. Look there. I stands for intention, and M stands for means. Vim, vision, intention, means. So what does that mean? Well, we'll talk about all three of them briefly, then we'll get some examples, and then we'll move into kingdom teaching with these things. Vision is simply your picture of reality that grips you. Most healthy people have some vision. It's their picture of reality that grips them. Now, for something to be a vision, there's two things that it has to have. A vision that will produce change. Uh, a vision that will produce change must be compelling If my vision is how to get one more pack of potato chips out of the cabinet without Connie hearing me, <laughs> that is not a real compelling vision for life. Okay, but, but vision that produces change has to be compelling, and it has to be sustainable. It's something that uh, it, it, it drives, and it keeps driving. So it has to be compelling and sustainable. And the second thing is it must be attainable. A vision will not drive you if you do not perceive you can attain it. I go down and work out. Uh, it's hard to tell, I know. And, uh, but it does me no good to cut the, he the cover off men's health or something with some guy that's got muscles bulging all over and put it up over the workout bench. So I can look like that someday. Because uh, I don't know if it's compelling or not. Connie keeps telling me she, if she wanted a guy with muscles, she wouldn't have married me. So I don't know. But it's not attainable. I'm 56 years old. I'm not ever going to look like that. That's not going to 
compel me to do anything to change my workout routine. See? So a vision has to be something that's compellable and attainable. Uh, vision is a very real part of AA when AA is properly understood and presented. AA is one of the most powerful models for transformation, I believe. It was born in Christianity. It was rooted in Christianity. And you say, well, I, they do higher power. Well, let me tell you, properly presented, it's a powerful tool for change for the properly motivated person. And it starts with a vision. Because it is not enough, and I deal with alcoholics and drug addicts on a daily basis, it's not enough to simply tell them how much alcohol is wrecking their life and how much drugs are wrecking their life. That will not produce change on whole. What they have to do is get a vision of themselves free from alcohol. A vision of a life not driven by drugs. They have to have a vision of freedom. And that vision has to be attainable and sustainable and compelling. But simply saying, how many more times do you want to wake up with a headache? It will bring the problem into focus, but it's not going to produce transformation. It takes a positive vision. And I'll drift all the way over into kingdom stuff automatically, so if I do, excuse me. But uh, telling people how hot hell is is not really changing a lot of people's lives. Right? That's not a vision. You might have a vision of that. But a vision is what we move toward. It compels us. It drives us. It draws us. And so for change to take place, we've got to have some vision to start with. And it always starts there. And then we have to have intention. We must have a sustaining intention to spend the necessary time and energy to pursue the vision. It takes a firm intention right here. And some people get hold of a vision, but they never form the requisite intention to go get it. <clears throat> An intention is more than, gee, I wish. Golly, wouldn't it be nice if? Intention is essential because projects of personal transformation, I'm not even talking about in church, I'm talking about any kind of transformation in life. Projects of personal transformation rarely, if ever, succeed by accident. We rarely just drift into change. Very little of human value occurs just by accident or drift. Every time I go in for my checkup, whether it's my cardiologist, my oncologist, or my family doctor, I know the first thing they're going to do is make me get on that stupid scale. <laughs> and I'm telling you, sitting in the waiting room, if wishing could make it happen, I would have brought eight less pounds with me. But I did not have the intention to do that until the moment I was ready to go on the scales, it was too late. I never formed the intention. So if change is going to take place, I've got to have a vision. I've got to form a well-defined intention. And then I've got to have means. I've got to be able to see some way to get there. There's got to be a pathway. There's got to be a route. There's got to be something that I can do that will get me to this vision. Because if I don't have means, remember I said one of the parts of vision is it has to be attainable. It's not attainable without means. The means is what puts it in motion. That's the three steps. And it applies no matter what we're doing. If we're trying to learn language, if we're trying to lose weight, if we're trying to build muscles, if we're trying to become a good bass fisherman, I mean, whatever it is, those are the steps that would be involved. And uh, what we're going to do, Pastor Daniel's going to share some more uh, illustration with that. I'm going to share some illustration with it. And then we're going to move into the idea of spiritual transformation and how that applies. Well, <clears throat> Dennis explained to you what the VIM is 
Well, let's look at how it applies to us very practically, just in our everyday lives, and then we'll move into the kingdom of God. He mentioned some things that, are, that we can all relate to, but let's say we're a young couple. Mary Beth and I are 24 years old. We, we have a dream of moving out of a trailer and into a house. And so we develop a vision. We begin to see ourselves looking at houses, and we begin to imagine the idea that one day we can be homeowners. But if all we do is go through the, the want ads, that doesn't change anything, does it? If all I do is go to Jerry Hughes Realty and say, one day I would like to be a homeowner. Well, okay, when? One day. What is your plan? One day. How's it going to happen? God's going to provide. That's not a great plan. Maybe a great statement of faith, but it's not a great plan. But somewhere you begin to say, well, what is it that I can do to see this? So I begin to see myself outside of a trailer on College Street in Beaumont into a house. And then through that process, we begin to look at what plan do we need in place. And I found out some things when I first started buying houses that you just didn't go and say, I like your house, I want to buy it. People want all your business. You go and say, I want you to give me some money. Those people actually want you to pay it back. So they want to know, I want two years of your tax returns. This is not your business what my tax returns are. Well, if you want to loan, it is. So that... I had to suddenly become very intentional. I had to go dig out two years of, of, law, of, of uh, taxes. And then I had to turn in paperwork. and do. I didn't have room for procrastination. I had to develop a plan. So I had to have a vision for a home. But then the intentionality started showing itself in a plan. And then there were some other things. They didn't want to know that I just had two years of tax returns. They made me get... Something from my employer saying that I was employed for a little Cypress Morrisville School District. And I was going to have a paycheck next year. Because they want to know that there was a means to make this happen. And so all through life we see that when great change begins to take place, it requires vision, intentionality, and means. When we think about sports, we, we oftentimes approach life in a very uh, much of a sports mentality. And so if I came up here and I was the Vince Lombardi of today and said, hey guys, you're my football team and we're going to win the national championship. We're going to win it. That's great. And I pumped you up. And I said, okay, go home. The Super Bowl is in February or January this year. I'll call you on game day. I mean, yeah, what's the chances of making it? Not just slim, but none. Somewhere we develop a plan. And we talk about being intentional. Hey, guys, this is what it's going to take to make it happen. We're going to have to do some things differently. We're going to have to plan ahead. We're going to have to situate ourselves. But then to get to the national championship, the Super Bowl in professional football, you've got to begin to back up. It takes a championship game, doesn't it? So that's a means. But it also takes some playoff games. So those are means. But then it also takes a regular season. So those are means. But also requires some preseason games, and those are means. And every one of those sticking games require this thing we don't like called practice. And then we had to take the off season to prepare for practice. And all those things are necessary, but guess what? All those things are just things to get us to what? The vision. No one ever runs off the practice field and said, Whoa! We won! Why? We had practice today. It's just a means. It means to the desired end, the vision. And so when we talk about this, let's begin to weave this in to where we want to go, whether it is winning a sports program, whether it's a lady wanting to fit to a dress, whether it's us wanting to get a new job or get a home loan. There's things that we begin to do that we begin to see the reality that it could be. And that's what Dennis was talking about. If you put up a picture of something that you know you're never going to be, you beat yourself before you ever started. So when we think about the gospel, as we go through today, I want us to elevate our vision of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. What the gospel of Jesus Christ really is. And as we develop a vision for that, see, I think a, a, a lot of the body of Christ, we develop visions on how to change the world, but we've never developed a vision on how to live in the kingdom. And you can't change the world without living in the kingdom. And so what we want to do over the next couple hours is dive into the vision of living into the kingdom. How to be intentional in a kingdom life. 
And what means are available for us to live both with intentionality and vision that will bring us to a place where we can do what God's called us to do. Our vision. And that, as we move forward, is what this morning...